We all come to the practice for the same basic reason. The fact that we're suffering, that we're stressed out, we want to be able to train the mind so that we don't have to suffer from these things. But the way we understand our suffering varies from person to person. In some cases it's in line with the Buddha's understanding, or at least the way he taught. Other times it's off in some other direction. And if we look at our minds, we find often that different parts of the mind have different ideas. We come to a quiet place like this just to get away from all the chatter of other people their views, their opinions, their idea of what's important. And then we find, much, much to our consternation, that sit here with your eyes closed, there's a lot of chatter going on in the mind. Some of it is a carryover from what you've been hearing from other people, and some of it comes from the fact that now the pressure from outside has been released. A lot of things can come bubbling up inside, different ideas, different attitudes. Some of them you can put away simply by saying, hey, look, we're here to train the mind. We're here to stay with the breath, to get quiet for a while, so we can sort these things out. But others don't go away so easily. Those are the ones you have to question. probe, figure out, okay, why is this particular idea so tenacious? Is there some real issue that it's coming from? Or is it simply from the mind's own avoidance? It doesn't want to face the question of why it is that you're suffering and realizing that it'll, the main suffering comes from within certain habits you developed. And you find there's a resistance to probing those habits. So if you find that the mind can settle down peacefully, go ahead and let it settle down. If it's not willing to settle down, you've got to ask, okay, what's going on here? What am I assuming? Because after all, the Buddha asked you to bring a minimum of assumptions to the practice. The suffering that really weighs the mind down comes from its actions, and you are free to choose what you're going to do. Actions here meaning not just actions of the body, of course, but the actions in the mind, the decisions, the choices in the mind. And you have the freedom to change those. You're not totally determined. We're not machines that just have to suffer. come at this problem of suffering simply because of our own lack of skill. It sounds easy enough if you're unskillful, just practice and practice until you become more and more skillful, but you find a resistance in certain parts. This is going to vary from person to person, but a willingness to question your assumptions is basic. And that willingness can be fired by the realization that you really are suffering and you need to do something about it. I was talking recently to someone who was eager to see that Buddhism become more responsive to people's demands and people's needs. And so what he really wanted to see was the, the students in charge, and sort of telling the teachers what they wanted to learn, and the teachers would provide what the people asked for. Well, it's treating the practice or treating Buddhism as a commodity. Something is going to be sold and you have to be sensitive to the the desires of the the buying public. But the question is, who is that putting in charge? I'm not talking about people, we're talking about which attitudes, which ideas is that putting in charge? 
and sometimes they're good, honest attitudes, and sometimes there's something way off. And so it's this willingness to question yourself, the willingness to say, okay, I'm going to put in the effort and put some of my assumptions aside for the time being. That's how you really get to see your assumptions to begin with and to test them. This is why you hear those stories about people aspiring to join Zen monasteries having to sit outside, outside the gate, huddled up against the gate for 24 hours just to show how sincere they are. And it's not just a matter of religious practice. Throughout Asia there's a feeling that skills are important and the teacher is the one who gets to choose who is going to study the skill. The teacher has to be impressed by the student's dedication. That's part of it. And also, going through that experience, the student gets to ask him or herself, how much do I sincerely want to do this practice? I'm sure that when you're sitting huddled there against the gate for 24 hours, you get a lot of time to think, do I really want to do this? Is this crazy? It's kind of a rite of passage. One of my acupuncturists told me the time after he had finished his medical training, he'd learned Western medicine and Chinese medicine in a college in Taiwan. But he wanted to further his training. He heard there were two doctors who were still alive who had studied with a very famous acupuncturist who was now dead. One was good at reading pulses, and the other was good at giving needles in the right way. He wanted to study with both. One was a lay person, the other was a monk. He went to the monk who was the one who was good at giving needles. And the first requirement, the monk said, okay, handed him a coil of wire and said, make a thousand needles for me. So the doctor went back and he made the thousand needles, came back, and the monk seemed a little surprised. But on the basis of that, he decided to train him. And again, it wasn't just the physical effort that went into making those needles. It was the time you had to think, do I sincerely want to do this? What inside me resists? By the time he'd reached the thousandth needle, he decided, okay, I wouldn't really want to do this. He'd sorted it out inside. So an important part of the meditation is doing this sorting out inside you. We often find the meditation difficult when there is this battle going on in the mind. Part of the mind wants to think about something else, and part of the mind wants to do the practice. It's not simply a matter of just waiting for things to settle down, although sometimes they will. But there are times when you also have to engage your resistance to see why it is you're resisting the practice why the mind doesn't want to settle down, why it doesn't want to look at what it's doing that's causing suffering. Because often we'll find, as we get more and more quiet, more and more attuned to what's going on, that we have certain habits that we really like, and yet they cause suffering. We don't like to see the fact that they cause suffering. We really like our cravings, we really like our desires. We like our greed, aversion, and delusion. And that's disconcerting. We'd like to think, well, the problems in the mind simply come from the fact that you're out there in society dealing with all kinds of crazy people. You can just get away from them for a while. The mind will settle down, and it'll be nice and in touch with its nature. But then you find that what you've got here is a very problematic mind. And the way to get around that, of course, is not to look at it as one mind. There are lots of minds in there. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha, when he was teaching, was not too specific about defining certain things, especially what things are. Like, what is your mind? He said, look at the activities. See where you have a choice. 
And if part of the mind tells you you don't have any choice, you have to do things a certain way, question that. Because otherwise your defilements stay in charge. It's the, again, that's the consumer-driven approach to Buddhism and seeing Buddhism as a commodity. It's something you've got to sell to yourself. sell to your defilements. And there's a certain amount of PR work that you've got to do for yourself. But ultimately you've got to realize that there are certain things that are just true in and of themselves. And we have to bring our level of truth up to that, our level of honesty. A while back I was talking to a psychologist about the project I'm working on, this book on questions. And he was especially interested in the idea of questions that should be put aside, because that's one of the duties, apparently, of a psychotherapist, finding that the person undergoing therapy sometimes will come up with questions that are a means of avoidance. They're trying to get away from really looking at themselves. And so the therapist has to say, be very firm. You've got to put that particular question aside. You see the same in the Buddhist texts. There was a monk who came to see the Buddha one time and said, I'm not going to practice until I get your answer on these questions. And he went down the standard list of hot topics of the day. Is the universe eternal? Is it not eternal? Is it finite? Is it infinite? Is the soul the same thing as the body? Is it something different from the body? What happens to a person after awakening, after death? When the awakened person dies, does that person still exist, not exist, both, neither? And the Buddha saw it, that for what it was. It's avoidance. The monk didn't want to look at his own suffering and what he was doing to cause his suffering, what he had to master in order to put an end to it. So the Buddha refused to answer his questions. Because as he said, the, the end of suffering doesn't depend on whether the world is eternal or not, or any of those other answers. It depends on your looking at your suffering and learning how to comprehend it. You see what's causing it and you learn how to let go of the cause and developing the qualities you need in order to do this skillfully. So you may find as you're sitting here, you've come all, gone to all the trouble of coming here to meditate, to practice. You sit down, you find part of your mind balks, doesn't want to do it. You've got to question that. And don't just hope that it'll go away. Sometimes you can avoid it for a while, and sometimes it's wise to just put it aside for the time being, saying, I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to do the practice. But there will come a point where it comes back. That's when you have to learn how to look behind the question. What's motivating the question? Is it simple avoidance? What are you trying to protect? What unskillful habit? One? Cherished way of doing things. Are you unwilling to look at? And often you find that the, once you've gotten behind the question, you see it's not really worth asking after all. For some questions will be answered in the experience of awakening, and other questions you'll see right through that it's not worth going there. Was it? The practice will help you see through the fact that the question was based on a strange assumption that really had no usefulness at all. The Buddha talks about how these questions that people bring that he says to put aside. It's not simply a temporary thing. He said, well, put those things aside for now, and then once you've gotten awakened, you get all the answers. that you've ever wanted about these things. Well, you do get answers, but they're different answers. He does point out the fact that once someone is awakened, they look back at these questions and they have no interest in them at all. They realize that they were total distractions. 
and they were motivated by unskillful traits of mind. That's the part we don't like to see. It's not simply mere innocent diversions. They're subterfuges. The mind throwing up resistance. So you notice these things coming up in the practice. And if you find that you can simply put them aside for the time being, that's fine. But if they keep coming back, coming back, you've got to ask yourself, well, where is this coming from? And look for the motivation. The question is a kind of karma. The fact that you're asking that question or making this demand. And to understand the karma, you've got to look at the motivation. Then when you've dispatched it, then you can get back to the practice. And the act of dispatching it is actually an important part of the practice. I mean, this is what insight is all about, seeing how the mind hides from itself. How it makes demands. It really get in the way. As the Buddha explained to that monk, this is making these demands for those questions that he had. It's like someone who's been shot with an arrow. And he refuses to have the arrow removed until he's learned who shot the arrow and what feathers were used in the arrow, what kind of wood, who made the arrow. As the Buddha said, if you trace that down, you'll die first. And we were dying from our suffering. Even though not physically dying from our suffering or our goodness is dying. We find it harder and harder to do the skillful thing. So what we want to do is focus on getting the arrow out. Because once the arrow is out, then you don't care what kind of feather there was. The real problem is taken care of. Sometimes your defilements will come up and say, this has to be taken care of and I've got to figure this thing out first or whatever. And they'll come with a real sense of urgency. They play the same tricks that people outside play on you. And this is what work is all about. It's not necessarily about important things, it's about what's urgent. This has to be done now. And if you don't stop and ask, well, is this really important, you just get your life gets fruited away with urgent things. You come and meditate, and you find, okay, there's urgent demands from your defilements. You have to keep asking yourself, is this really important? And when you learn how to make that distinction between urgent and important, you will have gone a far away on the path. And you have an important tool for keep, to keep going farther.